Hello and uh, welcome to orthopedic trauma. As paramedic students, you probably will realize pretty quick that a lot, there isn't a lot that has changed from EMT school to paramedic school when it comes to orthopedic trauma. However, one of the major changes is we now use opiates as your primary form of pain relief, but it isn't your only option for pain relief, and so we'll discuss some of the other things. One of the, Another major focus that this course has is your recognition or identification of suspected traumas. So looking at the mechanism and knowing where to look and where to expect the trauma to be and how to anticipate that. While we will show some uh, treat some new treatments and such like that, there will be a lot of this that's review. So we'll move through this fairly quickly. As always, national standards competencies, you can pause and read them if you care to, but for the most part, that just proves to you, that is just for you to reference whether or not I did my job. All right, so as you can tell, these are very common injuries. However, they are very rarely life-threatening. It's not that they aren't, it's just they're very rarely. Generally, you want to look for your ABCs and identify your life-threatening injuries prior to uh, treating your orthopedic trauma injuries. So, just reminders, what does the muscle skeletal system do? It's our internal frame, it's our network, it's what gives us support, but also, as we've talked about in chest trauma, creates that cage around our, heart, our vital organs and things like that. Uh, it can serve as a good indication of more significant trauma underneath. Generally, if the trauma was significant enough or the force was significant enough to cause trauma to your musculoskeletal system, there's a really good chance that underlying organs have also been involved. This is an area that a lot of people seem to get confused and remember. So when separating your uh, skeletons, the axial skeleton, which is the center, the vertebral column, the skull, the ribs, and the sternum. That is all that is involved. Skull, spine, ribs, sternum, which part of the ribs in a lot of senses. Now, the appendicular skeleton is everything that attaches to that. So your pelvic girdle, your pelvic bones, your pelvis, those are part of the appendicular skeleton. They are not part of the axial. So your pelvic girdle, your pectoral girdle, these are um, your clavicle, your scapula, and all that, and then your... Um, upper and lower extremity, you know, humerus, femurs, radial ulna, tip fib. So, uh, in this course, we're going to focus more on your major bones. We're not going to get particular about identifying your metacarpals or all, and all your carpals and such like that and, and tarsals. So, um, mentioned that already. So, Now, uh, an interesting thing to remember when we're discussing uh, hand trauma is there are no muscles in your fingers. There are muscles in the palm of your hand, but there are no muscles in your fingers. All of the muscles in your fingers, or, excuse me, all of the muscles that control your finger movements exist in your forearm here. And that's why if you um, squeeze your fingers and move them around or make a fist, you'll see your forearm flex and change. That is important to remember because anytime a patient has a injury to their forearm, any movement of the fingers could aggravate that. As in, you're causing these muscles here to contract and that could cause pain here. So when we're um, immobilizing a patient with a forearm, you know, a radial ulnar injury of some sort, we always have to immobilize the hand as well. We'll see some more about that later. All right. Um, I feel like this is uh, fairly simple, and so that's why I'm not expounding on it quite heavily. Um, the tibia is the anterior bone. Um, 
the fibia is the posterior phone no bone excuse me not phone <laughs> all right um so what leads to a lot of these well as you can see there's a number of different things i think one of the ones that we overlook although it isn't uh, it is fairly common is medical conditions medical conditions causing a, de a degradation of bone a weakening of the bone or uh, of some sort or uh, damage to the muscles the nerves that control the muscles and so on and so forth so otherwise I think these tend to, this tends to be the reason we get uh, fractures in bones yeah so unfortunately for those of us over age 35 our bone density is going to continue to reduce or slowly not rapidly but will slowly um decrease over time as um and hence nutritional supplements tend to be very important um and often and sometimes even hormonal supplements <clears throat> osteoporosis while both while possible in both males and females is predominantly found in females especially postmenopausal females this is a significant reduction in the density of their bone uh, leading to a um, loss of the internal frame and structure of the bone. I'm going to show you some pictures of that uh, in a kind of comparison sense. Um, that's C side. Okay, this is a good one. No, that's just thick. Come on, where's the good ones? Or man, I don't want fake. I want real. Uh. artist renditions so that's why okay so here here's a good example let me flip this over for you um, All right, so he, on this image here, we can see these are actual photos of cross sections of bones. Uh, on the far left, looking at the screen, this is what normal bone would look like. Uh, very open, small frameworks, but very densely um, structured. But as the osteoporosis continues, you move to a much more open network of bones and you can actually lose the internal cross section where while it doesn't look like you still have that honeycombing or that uh, catacomb, whatever you want to call it, that structure, that scaffolding, you can lose that and have essentially a hollow bone on the inside. So... Um, and you see the steps of degradation. This is why osteoporosis can be so damaging to a person. Uh, you'll find this in your long bones. Like here is an example in the femoral head um, showing how that can happen. But you can also, ah, this was, the, this was one of the pictures I was looking for. This is an excellent example of um, osteoporosis. So, um, here you can see a very strong, dense structure. This is a very sparse, lightweight structure. Uh, while the actual structures are themselves thicker, they are much less um, common. They're more sp uh, sporadic or sparse. And so that leads to a increased risk of fracture. Um, there's another good example of an actual photograph of osteoporotic uh, injuries. Um, this will happen in your spine, making it easier to fracture your spine. It can happen in your pelvis. It can happen in any of your extremity 
uh, bones. The ones that we are most concerned about is probably your spinal um, vertebrae and your humoral head, or femoral head, not humoral head, femoral head, because those bones do uh, handle so much uh, weight and force applied to them. So it's with that we want to anticipate the potential for fractures. I have been on calls and taking care of patients whose osteoporotic or excuse me whose fracture was the result of osteoporosis and all they were doing was walking. They were walking through their house and suddenly their hip broke and they fell. So just because the patient fell and has a broken hip doesn't exactly mean that the hip um, broke when they fell. So you want to consider that that this could have been the result of uh, just a, almost a nearly spontaneous fracture. So, forces in motion. As we said in earlier sections of this chapter, we have um, the direct force trauma as occurs when the organism or the tissue is not able to absorb that energy indirect is when um like that would be an example of the lover's leap where a person jumps from a high position keeping their legs stiff lands on their feet but then results in a lower lumbar vertebrae fracture compression fracture of some sort because of the indirect force that transmission of force or a person who um stands on the brake pedal and fractures their femur or something like that. All right, so here we can see a couple, here's a classic example of what's called the dinner fork fracture. Um, notice how it is a complete fracture of both the radius and ulna. So generally right in this area here, as you can see in the picture, that results in almost a second wrist. The muscles of the forearm up here in this region are going to contract causing the hand to go up like that, but because it's not the wrist itself, it's actually going to create a second uh, bend in this spot right here, um, resulting in that flex that we can see. A very easy uh, fracture to treat, a very easy fracture for us to splint and bandage, tends to be recoverable. We'll, while this example is showing an elderly patient where osteoporosis and with those hands almost guaranteed a uh, arthritis of some sort has been uh, contributed to it, we'll see these in all age groups, very common in kids, teenagers, young adults. Uh, because that's what happens when they're like skating, biking, skateboarding or whatever, and they fall and try to catch themselves with their um, outstretched arm and place all their force on that forearm. So here's our different fractures. These are all um, very common fractures that we will see. You can see the compression fracture on the far right. Well, let's see. Let's start uh, left to right. So we have the transverse fracture. We have the oblique fracture. Then we have the twisting or um, rotational fracture. Uh, that's that tends to be a corkscrew where there's multiple fractures along it from a twisting. Uh, we have a, a excuse me, that's a crushed or shattered. Um, I'm trying to remember the specific term on that one. Um, I believe it's just a crush fracture where the bone is in multiple pieces there and then you have the green stick fracture where the bone is fractured on one side but not on the other and comes from the name of like if you take a green a small green sapling or whatever and try to split it and how it rips on one side but the other side remains intact um, these fractures can be simple or compound um, where they are basically still in position or they have been displaced so now this is obviously a much more uh, significant concern because this is an open fracture. Now, while I would say, yes, that's obviously an open fracture, it also looks like some form of crushing injury. We got some degloving going on. The skin is torn to pieces, a bit of an extreme example of an open fracture. Open fractures can be as simple as they fractured their ankle, It their um, 
lower tib tibia has protruded outside of the skin, but then the skin or it pulled back into the skin, and then all that you have is a small laceration at the bottom of the skin. And we'll see some um, examples of that later. The small laceration will be right around the calcaneus, or right above the calcaneus at the ankle bone. So this is a great example of an ankle fracture, lower tip of fib. We would call that a distal tip of fib fracture. Patient also seems to have a fungal infection in their great toes, uh, nail. Um, so they might need to worry about that later, obviously. But as you can see here, you, the strong angle of that bone where the tibia ends and then the ankle bone rotates to the right or we would rotate that um, laterally away from the body is what that rotation is there would be a small laceration or it would look like a laceration right at the base of the bone there right at the top of the ankle joint this would be um possibly closed probably does or um not gaping is what i meant by closed and not bleeding heavily so it may not even seem to be significant so you're kind of like well is this just a laceration or is this an actual open fracture well there's an easy way to look at it or to determine that if you were to look closely at the discharge coming from the wound if you were to see any yellowish substance um it might be honestly look like melted butter um that would be bone marrow that is the white bone marrow uh, or, or yellow bone marrow coming out of the center of the tibia and is referred to commonly as bone butter uh hence you know it looks a little because it looks a little like butter that is a great way to be able to identify is this a laceration or is this an actual um, open fracture that has uh, retracted the bone back into the skin uh, I had a trauma surgeon teach me that a long time ago after bringing in a fractured ankle um, so we'll go over some ways to treat this and and handle that but like I said, most of these are going to be non-life-threatening injuries, and we want to make sure that they're not distracting us from their uh, greater concerns. Here's another example of a closed ankle fracture. Um, this patient obviously has a lot of external trauma as well, some abrasions and such like that um, associated with this uh, closed uh, distal tib fib fracture. Now, why is that bone, uh, or why is it angulating? Why is it deformed like that in rotation? Well, that's probably due to the lack of uh, structure, the lack of continuity of that bone, resulting in muscle spasms in the proximal muscles closer to the knee and up in the calf, and that's pulling that bone to the side there. And um, that creates a lot of cramping pain in the muscles and a constant pull of your bone ends towards each other and so what we'll do is we'll try to apply uh, traction to the not traction in the traction splint but we'll try to apply pressure maybe even reset it um, and splint it in a manner that keeps it from being pulled tight or pulled off to the side and that will reduce a lot of that discomfort so um, now Musculoskeletal injuries may also include things like joint and ligament damage. So our joints are surrounded by uh, ligaments. Tendons are what connect the muscle to the bone, tendon muscle to bone. But ligaments are what form our joint capsules. So we could tear a ligament, stretch a ligament or whatever, and that would lead to a dislocation or increase our likelihood of dislocations. So our bones will, um, or excuse me, our joints rely on how healthy our ligaments are to stay um, in position. This is one reason that I've often told patients, not necessarily that they like to hear it, but have told them, hey, you know, a fracture is always a lot better than a sprain um, or a dislocation because fractures are pretty easy to heal a bone. Sprains, strains, and dislocations are a lot harder. I should say sprains and dislocations are a lot harder to heal because it deals with the stretching of a ligament or tearing of a ligament. So let's talk about dislocations a little bit. 
Subluxations are partial dislocations where the bones are just slightly out of position. Luxation is a complete dislocation. This is where we would see gross deformity to that joint. If you've ever been to a chiropractor, I'm sure you've heard the word subluxation before. It just means partial um, dislocation. Yeah. So diastasis, this is where your ligaments have been damaged as a result of the luxation or subluxation. So, all right, here we have a great example of a sprained ankle. Notice a little bit of contusions on the distal tibia fibia of the leg, along with some ecchymosis or some contusion, which is really in this case not true contusion because the contusion is where the direct injury is when the root the damage to the capillaries and all that we see that up around the above the ankle bone on the distal to fib but we see the ecchymosis the discoloration um distal to that and on the lateral side of the foot and around the calcaneus area that is where the blood has pooled as a result of the damage that was up in the uh higher above that in the injury and so oftentimes that discoloration that ecchymosis will not pre present until a couple of days after and this is why you know you might sprain your ankle it looks okay but next morning it's all black and blue and then over the next few days it turns to yellow and stuff like that as the uh, tissue heals um yeah very painful um uh tends to cause people not to want to move We'll talk more about how to handle that earlier. But this is caused by a stretching or a tearing of the ligament. If it's just a stretch, it means you're going to be more likely to do it again. Tearing is going to be associated with a complete loss of function of that uh, joint for the time being. and will likely, almost guaranteed to require, I should say it is guaranteed to require surgery to re uh, reconstruct that ligament, to reattach it, whereas a, um, a simple stretch you know, a simple sprain is a lot harder to recover from because ligaments are not intended to have elasticity. So when they lose, when they get stretched out and they lose their shape, it's a very hard for them to grow back. Now, that's sprains. Sprains are dealing with ligaments. Strains are dealing with the muscle. This, a, um, this is when a muscle has been involved and you'll have a much larger area of injury because the entire muscle it's will hurt versus just the localized to that tendon. Um, when identifying the difference between sprains and strains and fractures, you got to look at what your mechanism of injury was. Um, your mechanism of injuries for fractures tend to uh, focus more on high energy direct force so i mean indirect force can happen can cause we discussed that earlier but we're looking at high energy direct force of some sort onto the body so whether that's um longitudinal or lateral impacts um transverse impacts against the bone you know hitting on the side of the bone I had a patient the other day um, 12, 12 year old boy playing middle school football was uh tackled falling down went to put his arm out to catch himself arm hit the ground and just as his hand hit the ground another kid came in for a tackle and helmet hit him right in the mid shaft humerus fracturing his humerus and it was fractured because of that direct lateral impact as his significant portion of his body weight was on that um extremity so um now a strain is going to come from like you're moving something you were doing a, a lift a pull a, you know some form of muscle action where you were trying to do it and or you hyperextended it and it pulls on the muscle so if you strained it your pain if you were to have a strain in your forearm it would be more in this area whereas a sprain would be more in this area at the actual joint so sprains tend to have pain at the joint whereas strains have tend uh, have the pain where the muscle groups are and um i think one of the best examples of a sprain would be a twisted ankle turning the ankle you're walking you rotate and the joint itself rotates or twists in the wrong direction Whereas a strain is going to be the result of um, like a hyperextension or um, excessive force on um, some form of muscle function. 
All right, so patient assessments, very straightforward. We're going to focus on our life-threatening injuries, um, which are very rarely going to be our musculoskeletal problems. When the musculoskeletal problem is the isolated injury, it takes full focus. We take our time, we package, we um, splint, apply ice, pain medications, whatever is necessary to make that patient comfortable for transport. But when we have life-threatening injuries, we want to um, focus on those life-threatening injuries and we may even ignore or do nothing for the musculoskeletal injuries during transport so um, spinal mobilization could be a very frequent uh, tool for um, multiple musculoskeletal injuries when I have a patient with musculoskeletal injuries but also suffering from like a multi-system trauma or other major concerns I will use the long backboard as the primary form of immobilization. So I'll spinal immobilization, yes, but then I can secure their arms and legs and feet or ankles or whatever to the backboard and provide my um, joint or musculoskeletal motion restriction that way. So I think this goes without saying. We've already talked about severe bleeding. While um, musculoskeletal injuries could result in severe bleeding, most of the time that severe bleeding is going to be internal. It's going to be a little harder to identify, and um, our focus is going to be getting them to the hospital. It's not like we can exactly tourniquet it off kind of a thing. All right. Yep. Said that. Right. Cool. Cool. Um, Obviously, this is only after all life threats have been uh, cared for. Uh, it, what is it? Re, what is required to note if circulatory changes? Well, you have to have a baseline. So prior to splinting, immobilizing, or doing any form of care or treatment to a patient with musculoskeletal injuries, you need to monitor for pulse sensory and motor function. Um, when you're dealing with a distal extremity or a distal injury like a, a tib fib fracture or whatever or a radial ulnar fracture, those can be significantly aggravated by a um, movement of the fingers and hands. So be cautious with your patient when you're asking for that pulse motor and sensory function. Asking them to wiggle their fingers or something like that could result in significant increase of pain. So be, just be cautious with how you go about that. You'll want to do um, cap refill, um, radial pulses or you know pedal pulses of some sort. Uh, do they have sensation? Generally speaking, if they have sensation and pulses, you're good. The motor function, while important, is not as important. So if it's going to cause significant pain, I wouldn't continue to have them uh, at least definitely not after the first attempt, but maybe not even have an initial uh, movement of the fingers if we suspect that it could cause injury or discomfort. Um, yes, so we do want to use sterile dressings um, and we want to be as careful and as possible when we have open fractures especially if it's an isolated open fracture and that's the only thing we need to worry about we will remember that is the circulatory system in the inside of the bone so when it gets healed that is in the bone itself we really don't want an infection in there and so we should be as protective as possible for those open fractures For the most part, um, musculoskeletal injuries do not require emergent transport. I am a big fan of transporting that patient to the most, uh, to the closest available facility because we don't want to exacerbate their pain with a long distance transport. However, we got to also consider where definitive care is. If you know that your local facility has limited ortho, you know they don't do proximal femurs or they don't do pelvises or something like that or they don't do pediatric ortho or maybe they can do a simple set and cast but they can't do pins and rods well then maybe the local facility isn't the right choice and you should transport to the facility where they will get that definitive care this will prevent them from having multiple um hospitals um 
hospital stays and transfers and such like that. So maybe driving a little bit further with them initially be the better outcome for them. When you have multiple system traumas or other major concerns, then your treatment is going to be based on those other life threats and not the musculoskeletal injuries. So never forget your sample history when discussing um, musculoskeletal injuries. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, comparing uh, left to right, look at injured versus uninjured is very helpful for identifying is this unique swelling to the injury or is this swelling already exist? Um, Right. So pain, paresthesia, per, uh, paralysis, pulselessness, pallor, pressure, these are uh, very common to all musculoskeletal injuries, but more so when you're dealing with compartment syndrome. It should, I, mean, I think it needs to go without uh, question that a patient who's experienced a musculoskeletal injury is going to have pain. They may very well have pallor. However, the more common tr uh, response to musculoskeletal injuries is a, a flushing, that redness, the swelling from the inflammation. But when that patient's musculoskeletal injury has resulted in a compartment syndrome, this is where the fascia around the muscle itself is no longer stretching and the inflammation within, a, within the tissue, within that muscle group inside that fascia is continuing to swell. More blood is flowing into there. Well, as that swells and that pressure builds, the fascia isn't stretching out. This results in a increase of internal pressure which can compress the veins now the arteries because they're pushing greater pressures will continue to push blood through the artery but the veins will start to compress which will restrict blood flow out this will lead to a swelling of the distal extremity so not just within that fascia group within that muscle itself but also distal to that you'll have a buildup of blood this results in a much greater swelling, a tension under the skin, an increase of pressure under the skin, because this is not a swelling caused only by a fluid shift into the interstitial space, but an expansion of your vascular space as more and more blood is pumped into there. Once that pressure increases to put pressure on your nerves, you'll have the paralysis and the paresthesia, the numbness, and the uh, which paresthesia is the numbness. This leads to a a, a loss of oxygen and function of those nerves, or B, the result of the uh, compression on the nerve and a lack of mo a nerve control to that extremity. So they're going to be like, oh, my hand's all tingly. That is a great example of where maybe you've wrapped the bandage too tight. So we can cause this problem by wrapping the bandage too tight, or we can cause the problem by, oh, we had the bandage on properly, but they've continued to swell and compartment syndrome is setting in. All we have to do is loosen that bandage or um, and so forth. Now, when it comes to pain with this compartment syndrome cons concern, we're looking for a significant increase of pain. The patient will commonly report, oh, yeah, my pain has been bad. It was, it's been bad and all that. But now it's like unbearable. It's like far worse. Um, one of the worst pains um, I've ever heard um, or my wife says she's ever experienced. Excuse me. Start that out. One of the worst pains my wife has ever uh, told me she's ever experienced, and she's had four kids, naturally, home births for three of them, so she's got something to compare it to, was when she broke her wrist. Um, she had a dentifort fracture of her wrist, as a, and the uh, when they cast it, they cast it um, too tight, and she continued to swell inside the cast, resulting in a sense of, in a form of compartment syndrome, which was, uh, you know, lost sensation in her fingers, tingling in her fingers, and a throbbing pain in her wrist, and that um, could create an extreme pain. So this goes, yes, it hurt, now it really, really hurts, kind of a thing. The pulselessness is a ladder finding, which then is followed by the pallor because the pressure is built up enough to now, instead of just cutting off the veins, it's now cutting off the arteries. You don't have blood flow into that tissue. You don't have, um, and so the pallor results from the lack of blood flow and you no longer have the pulse. Um, yeah, I think these should go pretty much without saying how do we um, inspect 
palpate. This is looking for point tenderness. Point tenderness is a great indicator of a bone fracture, whereas lo localized or diffuse tenderness tends to be associated with your sprains and strains more. Uh, point tenderness would be like, let's say my arm hurts. Okay, well, does this hurt when I'm touching this muscle? No. The tendon now. No, 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 no. Whoa, that hurt right there. Okay, so we have a fracture of the bone right there versus a sprain or whatever. You know, every time you touch that muscle or the tendon associated with that joint or the ligaments somewhere around that joint, you're going to have significant pain because the whole area hurts from the tendon or the ligament trauma whereas the bone fractures will be very localized very point tenderness and yeah oh that hurts yeah oh yeah 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 okay that's probably not a fracture fractures are where they're like oh that hurt there's a very distinct yep that's the spot and they um hurt from that uh yeah so that's your point tenderness, uh, deformity, instability, ab um, abnormal joint. <laughs> that's where, well, there's not supposed to be a joint here in the middle of the humerus. We, we, we know the joint's supposed to be there, and now you have another joint here. That would indicate a problem. That should be going without that. But that's what it's talking about, abnormal joint or bone continuity, um, displaced bones. We've seen in some of our pictures already. So, um... Yep, cool. Oh, but that is a good point there, the second one. Consider what their pre-injury level of function was. Was this person able to walk? Was Did this person have full control and function of their arm? If you're dealing with a patient with like muscular dystrophy or um, cerebral palsy or uh, let's see, even um, Lou Gehrig's or ALS, something along those lines, it's possible that they didn't have function of that extremity prior to the injury. So the fact they don't have function now or had limited range of motion or something like that. So you do want to keep that um, in mind. So I've mentioned this before in other parts of reassessment, but I feel like we sh can't hear it enough. If the injury was, if the extremity or the area was injured in a, like, since we're talking about muscle skeletal, um, if there was an injury to that bone, or you had a fracture to that bone or strain on the initial assessment, you will still have that fracture or strain on the reassessment. There is no healing of the bones between the, the 15 minute assessments. So don't palpate those extremities or those areas again. You already identified injury, don't do it again. Now, um, when you have areas of the body that maybe you didn't notice an injury first or weren't getting a complaint of pain on the initial, then you might want to do a reassessment on those because often other distracting injuries or concerns could result in the patient not reporting the initial in the injury there um, well while that injury starts to develop also look for um, compartment syndrome and that monitor for that compartment syndrome though generally isn't going to result during the initial um, treatment and transport you might see like if you're called to do an inner facility transport from one you know from a er to an orthopedics uh or a hospital that has orthopedics or something you may be concerned about compartment syndrome there but really where we're going to see the biggest concern for compartment syndrome is the patient who was injured or fractured their arm yesterday or you know the day before and now they're at home and ha reporting significant changes of their pain or discomfort it's where we're really going to um see that all right, so that wraps the section on uh, assessments and uh, anatomy. We're going to move on to treatments and the types of fractures and how we're going to deal with them from here on out. So with the treatment of fractures, as you can see, these are your standard um, steps. Obviously, fracture, uh, infection is really only a concern if it's an open fracture in which you're dealing with the bleeding. Managing internal bleeding, though, can be a much more complicated task and is a really big concern because if it's a pelvic fracture, that's a lot of bleed, 
blood loss. I mean, I couldn't be up to 3,000 milliliters of blood loss right there. You know, a uh, femur fracture could be 1,500 milliliters of blood loss. And so we want, and then this is just from the bone itself. This is assuming we haven't ruptured a adjacent artery of some sort. Mobilization is going to be one of the best ways to control that internal bleeding. It also reduces pain, makes the patient more comfortable, making the patient more comfortable, and this means healing. The healing process can be more effective. Now, when you're dealing with sprains and strains, your rest, ice, compression, elevation, and splinting is really the way to go. Rices or rice is a good way to remember that one as well. So. Uh, here is your breakdown of the amount of blood that can be lost from various musculoskeletal injuries. Like I said, this is assuming that the adjacent arteries are not ruptured and that this is purely a localized injury. So, 3,000 milliliters, pelvis, uh, femur, 1,500. Notice the humerus is a far uh, smaller bone, so only up to about 500 milliliters of blood before it'll tend to clot off, meaning... Most of the time, if you only have an isolated humeral fracture, fluid resuscitation and fluid is, um, are not really needed because the body can compensate for that fluid loss quite easily on its own. Same would go with your tib fibs or your ankles, elbows, things like that. All right, so always move simplest to more complex when it comes to pain control, though when you have very obvious uh, deformities, very obvious musculoskeletal injuries, you may want to start thinking um, advanced pain control right away. Splinting can be helpful with your pain reduction during transport, but it's not really going to... So what it's going to do is prevent the aggravation or increase of pain due to movement rest and elevation that's going to help reduce pain in the long run as well as heat or ice now ice is really important in the early stages of the injury whereas heat can often be more helpful when you're dealing with or excuse me ice can be really helpful in the early stages of a sprain or a fracture but heat can be more beneficial with your strains and your later uh care you don't want to put heat on it early on um, again these are low impact ways of treating pain splint so we don't cause the pain to spike due to movement rest and elevation this more long-term care but some fractures some injuries are going to require a continue or an immediate treatment intervention for that pain and so we'll move straight to analgesics what are those well uh oh well, or antispasmodic which would be a muscle relaxer of some sort um with analgesics we could use things like naproxen um with or you know which is a leave ibuprofen um you know advil um Tylenol could work, though it really is just a pain reliever, whereas the naproxen and ibuprofen being non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can go a really long way towards reducing that inflammation that's causing the pain in the first place. You could use um, Tordol, sorry, I don't I always, you know, Tordol, Tramadol, try to keep those straight. Tordol, which is the anti-inflammatory, is very effective. But then when you have more significant concerns or you don't have those medications available to you, you can go for the opiates like fentanyl, morphine, Tramadol, Demerol, um, good old-fashioned Dilaudid. And um, we don't normally see Flexeril and other muscle relaxers like that in the pre-hospital environment. Those tend to be or longer term pain management. So cold packs, reduce pain and swelling. This constrict, vasoconstricts and prevents the overall shift of fluids into the interstitial space, resulting in reduced tissue trauma and swelling. Heat therapy, always, like I said, always avoid within the first 72 hours. After that, you want to improve blood flow to the area because you want to be bringing in nutrients and all that to restore the tissues and to reduce that stiffness. But because of the inflammatory mediator release in that first 48 hours, you really don't want heat because that's just gonna compound it, making the swelling and uh, tenderness that much more significant. So I would um, 
Remember that. Ice, 20 on, 20 off for the first 20, 48 hours. And then um, the um, heat for after that. Kind of mentioned this already. Those are all good points. Uh, we already mentioned making sure that you assess pulse motor sensory function before and after splinting. Um, any wounds should be covered before splinting. If your patient is dealing with an isolated extremity trauma, don't move them before you splint. Splint immediately. However, if your patient is dealing with multiple system trauma and multiple injuries, then splinting becomes a very low priority. You're not going to delay treatment or transport because you're trying to splint, splint an ankle fracture or something like that. All right, so we do want to pad the splint. We don't want to uh, be causing pressure injuries or anything like that but we'll, because of the splint. If the patient has any dislocations, we need to uh, splint the entire bone. Um, this would be a joint dislocation of some sort. Um, splinting the knee tends to be more effective in the extended or you know straight man elbows are more easily splinted in a right angle like this tends to be more comfortable um, and the whole point of the splint or the traction or whatever it is is to reduce the patient's pain so if the pain is increasing after it has been applied appropriately you're gonna have some pain while you're applying. That's not a reason not to do the splinting. It's like, all right, the splint is in place, we did everything properly, and they're still hurting a lot. So that's when a uh, um, that's when you're gonna to need to do um, to remove that splint and try another option. So what's the point of it? to keep it from moving. So therefore it does need to be firm. We're padding it so that it doesn't cause pressure injuries, but we want it to firm because we're trying to create that immobilization. Um, ice packs are kind of hard if you've wrapped it up too much because if you put too much of a wrap on it, well, the ice pack's gonna be insulated away from the skin and not gonna be effective. So you may not um, have that benefit there. Um, So types of splints, rigid splints, most easily applied, most difficult to use in my opinion because um, frankly they are not very effective. They These are like a glorified version of the Boy Scouts um, here. Yeah sure it's specially made and padded and all that great but they just really are not a great splint option when other options are available. If it's all you got, it's all you got, you got to do it, and you can do this. But, you know, we're wrapping it up with ace bandage and triangular bandage. To be perfectly honest, I would rather take this particular example that it shows us where we have uh, one or two board splints. And it doesn't have to be two. You can, you can effectively splint the leg with one board splint. And instead of doing an ice, uh, you know, individual triangular bandages like that, get your... Uh, couple of big like six or eight inch ace bandages or or even cling cling would work too and wrap the whole extremity that way nice secure wrap to that uh board splint that's probably the better uh the more effective way of doing this and it does take two providers it's going to be a minimum of two people to apply a rigid splint like that my absolute favorite way of treating a, um, a shoulder injury, dislocated shoulder or a um, clavicle fracture, something like that, or uh, these with the sling and the swath, the high sling like that. When and then the sloth, um, swath, sloth, <laughs> swath to hold it to their chest so it's not moving around. When a patient has a extremity fracture, like a forearm fracture or something along there, well, you don't need to have it slung in this position. You may do a low sling and it doesn't necessarily need to be swathed to their body. The swath is gonna be more helpful when it's a shoulder or clavicular injury. So, um, so there you go. Um, pneumatic splints, one of my favorite. I would say my second favorite splint 
I uh, used when I worked in Pennsylvania for a long time for a while we had these on the trucks they're amazing in my opinion they're a um, very thick heavy rubber plastic type inflatable um, pouch that zips up around the extremity so you have the um, you unzip it, fold it around the extremity, zip it up. It is limited based on the size of the patient. If you're somebody who is extremely overweight, it may not fit. Um, but for the average person, it works quite well. Um, once it's in, uh, zipped around the extremity, it has a tube on it that you inflate, use to inflate it. Um, when I think one of the biggest drawbacks of why it didn't catch on more popularly is you have to, generally, you have to use your mouth to inflate it. Um, and uh, but once you inflate it it is a complete immobilization of the extremity it can also work really well for providing direct pressure to uh, large lacerations or something that would necessarily need a tourniquet because you can pad that wound wrap uh, the splint inflate it and then it holds that direct pressure on it so really awesome um, form of splinting these in my opinion are the best this is the pinnacle of air of splints that I've ever used uh, I in fact used one very recently on on that 12 year old humoral head uh, humoral fracture mid shaft you wrap it around whatever position that extremity is in it does not matter you place it you wrap um, secure it with the straps and then you use the suction the vacuum to pull the air out it's filled with these little plastic beads which makes it radio translucent so it can be x-rayed and it compresses the extremity to get together it compresses all those beads together around the extremity turning that splint into a rigid it goes from so basically it forms whatever shape you want and then goes rigid due to the vacuum so uh, awesome for a variety of splint of extremity fractures that you just you can't really explain why or how to shape it um, yes they are expensive which is probably the most uh, the biggest reason why we don't see them more often they're hygienic um, I know there's been some concern with like being able to retrieve it again from the hospital after you've transported the patient and then you get, um, I feel like this shouldn't be an issue anymore, but it has been an issue in the past where unknowledgeable staff don't know how to take it off and then they just end up ripping it or cutting it or something and ruining it, which is never a good idea, but vacuum splints. And if there's something that EMS should be able to get a grant for, it would be vacuum splints in my opinion the vacuum mattress i wish we would replace a um our long backboards with vacuum mattresses with vacuum splints we uh this would be a far more uh effective means of immobilizing a patient's long spine um you, you including their pelvis or anything else would be really useful um yes they're bulky they they're take up a lot of room in the um, ambulance I like the long board doesn't but one of the bigger issues with the vacuum mattress using it as a long board or in place of a long board is it doesn't allow you to um, assess the patient or reassess the patient once it's been placed it's pretty much going to be for isolated injuries if the patient has multi-system trauma where you would have to reassess their abdomen or something like that or at least or their back or um do the whole trauma naked or whatever you're not going to be able to effectively do that after the splint has been applied although it may be use perfectly useful once the splint has been applied so, um, I mean, prior to applying the splint, traction splints, very useful tool, probably underutilized a lot. A lot of people seem they're like, oh, I know how to do that bra. I don't need any help. And you're like, yeah, you don't because you hadn't done it in a long time. So you forgot. Um, there's a couple of different methods here. We have the hair traction splint and a, uh, another form is a singular, uh, rod um, I don't remember what the name of the company is that makes those more commonly. I think it's the same people who make KEDs. Um, yeah, it's called a KTD, a Kendrick Traction Device. And it basically works 
I like this, but it has one collapsible rod that runs along the inside of the femur that you extend it out. It's not as strong as the hair traction splint, but it can be as effective and it's far less bulky and a lot easier to move the patient around with afterwards. Um, but what do we use a traction splint for? These are for um, mid shaft femur fractures. You cannot use this if it is a proximal or distal femur fracture because if this is proximal, how do you know this is femur and not humoral head or femoral head? I keep doing that. Femoral head or pelvic or just a dislocation. Also, if it's a distal femur fracture, are you sure that it is the femur and not the knee? And if it's the knee, then using the or the, if it's the knee or the um, hip dislocations or fractures, then you're just going to um, cause further damage by separating the bones. Also, if it's a proximal femur and it's, it is the femur, but it's proximal, then the pressure that the um, tra hair traction splint applies to the around the groin is going to aggravate that proximal femur and not do uh, any benefit there. And this goes for whether you're talking about the Kendrick traction device or the hair traction device, either one. So, um, or hair traction splint. So this goes for either one. This is a multiple person f uh, process. These should only be used on adults and children over the age of eight. Um, some places would recommend not using it until the child hits puberty, but definitely never use it under a child of age eight because their bones are, um, excuse me, their muscles are not as developed as they are for older people. And so you can cause insane muscle damage by stretching as you're trying to create that traction on that femur and straighten those bones out. Cause that's the whole point. You've had a femur fracture and the bone is dislocated and overlapped in some way, right? Well, you're trying to draw that out so that they're back in line again. Well, if you're doing this on a pediatric, you can easily draw it too far and start stretching and actually tearing the bones and the ligaments. And so this is why you don't use it under children with children under eight. Um, and I really would not recommend using it um, unless the child is in an adolescence uh, simply because of that uh, concern. And that's just kind of like a personal, like, eh, I don't know if I want to go that young. So um, what do you do? Well, this is for the unstable femur fractures that do not have distal circulation. The point here is to restore distal circulation. I was taught that if you have a pedal pulse, you don't need a traction splint because you already have circulation. All you want to do is stabilize it so you don't lose that circulation. Don't go moving it and um, manipulating it and things like that that would result in loss of pulse. But if you already lost the pulse, strap it around their groin, you know, the proximal area of the femur, place the ankle cuff around the ankle. And this is where most people mess up is they can't seem to figure out how to put the ankle cuff around. I mean, it's really shouldn't be that hard. And we will practice it on the 20th for our skills day. Place the ankle cuff, pull the traction. And what is your goal with pulling traction? only until you get palpable pedal pulses. The patient will probably complain of, complain of significant pain as you're drawing that traction, but once you extended that bone to where the muscles have now gone back to normal position and not that cramped, uh, contracted state, and you get those bones um, adjacent to each other again, well, now you're going to have a significant reduction of pain. The pain will be relieved and you will be very, very happy, uh, or they will be very happy and you'll feel at return, return of pulse as long as the femur, or excuse me, the uh, femoral artery has not been majorly uh, ruptured or lacerated or something like that. Generally, the idea here is the pain in the contraction is clamping off that femoral artery and we're not getting blood flow to the foot and so we're trying to restore that pulse and blood flow through with the traction splint all right buddy splinting sometimes referred to as anatomical splinting this is where you're going to splint the patient and uh, extremity against another extremity you can do that with a um 
like leg to leg or finger to finger, uh, toe to toe. The leg to leg is a little harder to do and generally would require you to place a, a board splint of some sort in between the two legs, but you can do that. Um, yeah, so I think that goes without saying. We don't need to uh, get hung up on that too much here. Um, so how are we going to prevent further injury? Don't allow the, the, the injured extremity to be um, left unrestrained or uh, without stabilization, uh, causing trauma, you know, where the bone ends will cause trauma to the muscles and to the vasculature or even the uh, nervous system. Um, reduce swelling, uh, prevent infection, get them to the right facility. All right, so a um, couple of different ways that you can have these peripheral nerve injuries, as you can see. Um, when you have a reduction of blood flow and blood loss to that area, well, you're going to, that could be because of contusions, uh, ruptured capillaries, or your bigger concern is going to be the tearing or essentially cutting of the aorta, oh my gosh, no, the arteries or the veins in that tissue. I don't know why I said that. Uh, but you could also cut, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, very just a few moments ago, you could cut the nerves um, resulting in paralysis or paresthesia to that area. So just because a patient has distal paralysis or paresthesia doesn't necessarily indicate that this is a spinal cord injury. This could be a localized nerve injury due to that uh, fractured bone or something like that. And sometimes it's as simple as a compression on that nerve that's uh, causing the problem and would heal over time. All right. Um, yes, you can have nerve injuries due to joint dislocations because as the bones dislocate, as the joint comes apart, it can pinch a nerve. Um, generally, once that's been placed back in the appropriate position, that is uh, recovered from quite well. Um, So I, talk, I talked a little about compartment syndrome before. Here's some of the examples of what can cause it. Two t your bandages, your splints and casts are too tight. I mentioned that situation with my wife. I uh, should point out that was while she was a teenager. Uh, she wasn't my wife at the time thing. Um, for those of you that can't figure that out. Um, the bleeding, the leakage of edema, that's the one that the um, fluid leaking in edema, sw basically swelling, fancy words for swelling, that's what's going to lead to the swelling inside the fascia compartment and creating that fa um, compartment syndrome, which will restrict blood out of that extremity or out of that area, ultimately causing a bigger a buildup of more and more pressure until you have a reduction of blood flow into that area. So, um... Burning, searing pain, uh, pain that is way out of proportion to what that injury is. This is where, yeah, it was hurting, but now it hurts really bad. Again, these are not injuries. These are not findings that you'll have on the scene of the trauma. This is what you're going to find after you've immobilized it, after you've placed a splint or compression of some sort, or the day after they got their cast placed or something along those lines. Now, if this is caused by a bandage, a splint, or something along those lines, then by all means, you can loosen that bandage a little, especially if it's like, yeah, this is just starting to happen. This hasn't been here. But let's say, oh, we were having really bad pain last night, and it's been swelling and swelling and swelling all night long. Now it's been there for a number of hours. That's not a good idea. You don't really want to just release that because if... Um, if it was a large extremity like a leg, that could be the equivalent of removing a tourniquet. And so you may not want to do, you're, you shouldn't do that on your own. But if it's a situation where it's like, yeah, they placed this um, splint on a couple hours ago at the ER and the pain is hurting, it's getting worse and not better. I've taken the pain medications. It's, you know, it's just, and it looks like my fingers are starting to swell. Okay, this is the development of compartment syndrome. Go ahead and loosen that splinter bandage. Um, it just means it was placed too tight. Whereas um, if it's been six hours or something like that, then you don't want to 
go releasing that. That needs to be transported to the hospital. So there, there's an example. If you are dealing with pulselessness, if you cannot feel pulses at all in that extremity, that has been there for too long. Um, So what do you do? Well, extremity elevations can help reduce blood flow to that area and allow passive draining of that extremity. Cold packs are going to constrict it. Um, and like I said, already already said about the bandage. Um, so fluids can work, um, but that that's just going to restore their circulating volume. It's not necessarily going uh, to directly, it's not like it's causing a fluid shift or anything like that, that'll pull that fluid back out of the interstitial space. Now, crush syndrome is a completely different concept. However, it has very similar uh, presentation or I should say it has very similar consequences. Unlike Compartment syndrome, crush syndrome is being created by the actual injury itself, the the object that caused the injury. And this is like a, con a slab of concrete or something has fallen onto them and is pinning them down, or tree or a rock or something. You'll you'll hear these conditions with um, hikers and outdoors people that get pinned under a rock or between two rocks or something like that as a result of um, a rock slide. Um, for this to happen, for this to take place, they need to be in that position, that restriction for four to six hours. It doesn't happen uh, instantaneously. So most of the time when we're we are seeing this in like a, um, a car wreck scenario, it's really not crush syndrome because they've only been in that pinned in that car for 30, 45 minutes at the most or whatever. Well, that could be different if that patient has been pinned with an actual cutting off of blood flow, lack of um, pulse in that extremity due to the compression for you know a, an extended period of time like it says four to six hours so where would this happen maybe in uh, an ice can storm where you have one of those 300 car pileups on the inter interstate where people are being cut out um, for hours and it's hours before you can get to them or in a collapsed structure environment, or uh, you know maybe after an earthquake or a tornado or something like that. That's where you're going to see these crush syndromes. We're not going to see this on a regular basis with car accidents and such. But what's going on? Well, if you remember the uh, chapter on shock, um, we talked about it in uh, resuscitation of the critical patient. I believe that was our chapter forty. This discussion during the EMSP 200 uh, unit. Um, we, when blood flow is stopped to the extremity, it results in a buildup of lactic acid, which then causes a fluid shift into the cells that cause them to lyse and burst. This will, re or burst, which is lysis. This will result in a uh, flooding of the capillary beds with potassium and myoglobin particles and uh, lysosomes and peroxisomes, lots of other toxic substances. And then what these will do when you remove, and so they'll build up in that extremity. Then when the crushing object, the pressure has been relieved, all of those toxins will be released into the central circulation and start flooding the body. So this, the potassium and such like that will poison the heart. The myoglobins will start clogging and blood clots, microvascular, um, microemboli and such will start clogging up the kidneys, um, could cause pulmonary embolisms. And you'll also be dealing with the, uh, the peroxisomes and lysosomes from the inside the cells starting to cause a t breakdown of other cells as they um, interact with other enzymes and such like that. You could end up with a disseminated intervascular coagulopathy where you're basically clotting all over the body and then the body reacts to that by releasing anti-clotting factors and cause a buildup of um, or it prevents you from being able to clot. Now you start bleeding uncontrollably. Generally, people who die of Crush syndrome, if they don't die from the potassium toxicity to the heart, they're going to die of renal failure, di and multiple organ failure within the next couple of weeks. So how do we handle this Crush, crush syndrome? Well, 
Obviously, you're going to handle the ABCs. If those aren't handled, um, you're not going to need to worry about it. If the patient is too far gone or you're triaging them black, well, then you're not going to happen. Remember, crush syndrome cannot be handled quickly. This is a patient who is going to need a lot of care prior to them being to the crushing object being removed. And if they're already in cardiac arrest or borderline cardiac arrest before you get them out, well, your chances are you're not going to have time they're not going to survive to get them out and so um those would be you know that would be like a triage red that will end up being triaged black if it was a multiple casualty situation due to the fact that you're not going to be able to get them out quick enough these uh processes of removal can be very slow um and definitely something that you don't want to rush so ABCs are handled, uh, oxygen, and start bolusing them with fluids. You want, because that crushed injury is currently absorbing a lot of fluid down there, and that is removed from the central circulation, so you want to fill them with fluids. Now, if that crush injury is also associated with bleeding, the fluid that was, the blood that was lost into that extremity could be lost completely to the outside world and is not, and so you're trying to replace it before it needs to be. And so you're going to do heavy fluid resuscitation, uh, you know, your 20 milliliter per kilogram boluses at a minimum. And cardiac monitoring is uh, very important. If the crush injury or the crush symptom or, yeah, the crushing object is not too proximal or over the torso, it would be possible and appropriate to apply a tourniquet to the extremity. So if you have like a distal, if the crush is on the distal femur or something like that, um, well, you can apply a tourniquet at the proximal femur. And then when you remove the ob object, it is as if the object is still there. Nothing in that extremity can enter circulation and you're not gonna continue to lose blood volume into that extremity. So then you've pretty much um, alleviated the need for concern with this crush syndrome because you apply the tourniquet, transport them to the hospital, problem solved. Let the doctors remove the tourniquet. But if if you don't have that tourniquet or you don't have the abdominal tourniquet option where you could do a, a abdominal aortic and your um, tourniquet, the abdominal aorta, well, then you're going to need to do this slow process of treatment. And what you do is you get your IV going, you got your fluids already on board, you set up the um, uh, EKG and you get ready with sodium bicarb and calcium chloride. So you're going to want to give a half an amp generally a half an amp of sodium bicarb immediately. Um, some protocols might say the full amp, but generally it's you pre-dose them with half an amp of sodium bicarb and then you um, have the other half the, of the amp ready to go afterwards if you start seeing problems. Now, you also want to give the patient sodium chlor or excuse me, calcium chloride. Calcium chloride um, or calcium glutinate. Calcium glutinate would be the by far the better choice, but it isn't always available in the pre-hospital environment. So the calcium glutinate, or, excuse me, the calcium one way or the other needs to be there in order to counteract the hyperkalemia that's going to happen as soon as the blood from that tissue is released into the circulation. A very important detail to remember is that if you put sodium chloride, gosh, sodium bicarb and calcium chloride into the same um, IV line, the sodium and the bicarb will disassociate and the calcium and the chloride will disassociate. But then the sodium and the chloride will bind and the calcium and the bicarb will bind. And while sodium bicarb is dissolvable in solution and calcium chloride is dissolvable in solution, sodium calcium bicarbonate is not. Car calcium bicarbonate will precipitate out. If you remember, we're at our hands-on practical back in s August, I think, when we did pharmacology and Roswell, you will remember we mixed, uh, we injected a syringe of calcium chloride into, into a uh, large ampule um, of sodium bicarb and then mixed it and they precipitated out into crystals sodium or calcium bicarbonate will not dissolve in um, 
solution very well and so you'll create crystals it'll crystallize it'll, and the word is precipitate in the IV line and then in their vasculature so you must have two different lines established and it's a good idea to have fluids running in both those lines bicarb on one side chloride on the other or calcium on the other side and um, as you start to relieve the pressure from the crush it's a very slow process where you relieve a little pressure you might see a little bit of blood flow um, and then we'll monitor the EKG. You'll, if potassium is making its way to the heart, you will start to see peaked T waves that will lead to widening QRSs. That's when you wanna start giving calcium and bicarb at the same time, you know, different lines, start pushing that in there. Once that starts to stabilize, then you can relieve a little bit more pressure and you may have to continue to push doses of those um, milliliters of each to try to um, control that. Uh, if you were to push a whole lot of calcium and a whole lot of bicarb all at once, like slamming it, well, then you would have the hypercalcemia and have problems with that. And uh, you don't want that. So that's why we're gonna give it slow. As we see the QRS widening, give a little, some and see if that narrows the QRS a little bit and then give some more and you continue to titrate that to effect. It's not necessarily like a true science of how many milligrams you need to give, but you just give like, milliliter or two see how that responds on their heart and give more if necessary all right so thromboemolytic diseases is very this is similar to what we're going to deal with um with a lot of these trauma but sometimes these may be produced or caused by the trauma itself basically we're talking deep vein thrombosis that when they can break loose and result in a pulmonary embolism and that's our biggest concern there um, how do we know that they exist well you're gonna have increased swelling on that extremity a lot of pain distal to that uh, point and then the warm uh, redness um, distal to the um, DVT because the blood is being trapped down there and can't get back out. And that just means that the patient is increased risk of pulmonary embolisms. Um, if they have a sudden a pulmonary embolism, they'll have sudden shortness of breath. You may have pain in the chest, but you don't always have pain in the chest. They will, um, I'm not sure what the difference between sudden dyspnea and dyspnea is. I mean, as a breath like, and they will probably start uh, breathing fast and have an increased heart rate because they're trying to oxygenate their blood more effectively another major finding is the patient will have a notably low spo2 that does not improve appropriately with oxygen administration while you can give them all oxygen go on a non-rebreather whatever you will see an increase of spo2 it will probably not increase the way you would expected it to they will frequently have clear lung sounds. Now, on severe pulmonary embolisms as an, and as later finding in PEs, you will have rails because of a fluid shift due to the increased pulmonary pressures, but early in it, you're not going to, you're not going to look for unexpected um, or adventitious lung sounds. They will be clear. They should be equal and bilateral. Remember, it is a blood clot in the vessels, not in the airway. So you do not have absent lung sounds. Um, and it isn't until later that this tissue has started swelling that will result in the wheezing in the rails. Um, now this is more long-term uh, affects the low-grade fever. We don't normally see this in the immediate uh, concern with trauma, um, but this can lead to, um, excuse me, we're talking about pulmonary embolisms. I've never seen a low-grade fever. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It tends to be a longer finding. Yes, these are concerns, right side heart failure, sh cardiogenic shock, ultimately cardiac arrest because you're going to die. This is where you work the arrest in the patients like purple from the nipple line up, um, this extreme cyanosis with blood trapping up there due to the PE. That is, um, those are very classic findings for your uh, PE arrests. Minor PEs are recoverable because we give supplemental oxygen and get them to surgery or some kind of thrombolytic therapy. But large PEs are uh, not survivable and generally die prior to getting them to the hospital. Um, 
Fat embolisms are another concern that's associated with uh, long bone fractures. Remember, any long bone that has uh, red marrow or uh, yellow marrow in it, um, red marrow tends to be in the ends, yellow marrow in the middle, that uh, fatty marrow is notorious for causing an embolism if it can get into the bloodstream. Remember, the blood vessels run in and out of the bones. Like, there's blood vessels running through them. They're not just solid, uh, dead tissue they are living tissue that requires perfusion well if you fracture that bone and then rupture the adjacent vein and that bone marrow leaks into that vein well it can go through your um circulation and causing an embolism and it's going to look just like any other embolism that you have it's going to get stuck in the lungs resulting in a um, but it could could potentially get stuck in another part of the body um if the vein leaves the bone and then goes into like the spleen or the kidney or the heart or the liver or something like that before going, not the heart, um, spleen, kidney, liver, some, something along those lines. If it goes through that before going to the heart and then into the lungs, you could have a occlusion in there. But general, see, no, that's like a complete misunderstanding. I'm sorry. Veins leave the bone and go straight to the heart. It's not going to go through another organ to get filtered. The only place venous blood goes through another organ before going to the heart is when it leaves the GI tract. The veins of the mesenteric um, tissue and around the, the um, small intestines will go through the liver before getting to the heart, but it's not going to leave a bone. So I'm sorry for that confusion. All right, so now we're getting into some specific uh, long bone, or excuse me, isolated injuries in this section. All right, so shoulder girdle, not really sure why it's saying shoulder. Um, we mentioned the clavicle, the scapula, I probably should say humerus, um, with the humoral head being the shoulder bone. Um, Clavicle fractures are very common in young children, especially with falls, um, it, wrestling accidents, uh, things like that. Any type of fall where from a height where they land on the shoulder, not from a fall down landing on their arm, but falling and actually taking the impact on their shoulder there. Um, they're not going, once you can identify it because when they're standing in front of you, um, they'll have a drooping shoulder, you know, one arm will be, one shoulder will be up and back and the other one will be notably lower. Um, they won't raise their arm. They won't be able, they'll be able to do this, but they won't be able to do that. Um, where the delt, because of the deltoid was of insertion on the clavicle. Um, they will also tend to, um, so like a stiff neck they'll do this like okay so if i have a stiff neck on this side of my neck you're going to walk around doing this right shoulders up and that kind of a thing but if i have a um shoulder a clavicle fracture and my shoulders drooping like that down they're also going to turn their head towards that drooping shoulder so they'll lean towards the low shoulder with their neck um Um, so scapular pain or scapular fractures, they can be here in the acromion process, um, which is kind of like the posterior version of the clavicle. So the clavicle is on the anterior portion here of the neck. Um, so the clavicle being right here and then the acromion being back there that's the bone in the posterior portion there where the muscles attached to so you have the clavicle or the scapula and it comes up to the acromion so that's where you get um so that increased arm abduction right um pulling the arm out the abduction abduction so that'll hurt there because the way that muscle hurts back that way um 
and then of course pain in that portion of the um, clavicle or not the clavicle but the scapula so what are we going to do for these sling and sloth it really doesn't matter to us whether it's a clavicular fracture a scapular fracture or a humoral head fracture you're going to sling and swath them all just remember to put the um when you do the sling and swath you have the front and then the inside the inside should go to the side that isn't injured whereas the front would um, or the outer portion of the sling would go on the side that is injured so um just keep that in mind when you're stabilizing but there's very few other um forms of splints that can really help with a clavicular shoulder or scapular fracture the point that this is making as far as spinal immobilization spi spinal stabilization is if the patient suffered enough impact enough trauma to cause a um, scapular fracture there's a really good chance they have other fractures as well or, or that in that energy could have been transmitted into their um, spine as well all right, so mid shaft humeral fractures mentioned those a bit earlier. You know, very obvious deformity, bro, uh, gross swelling, instability. I mean, they're going to be like they raise their arm and it just like hangs. Um, inability to move the elbow effectively. They should still have good function of their fingers and hands because those muscles insert here in the forearm and not affecting the humerus. So. Uh, moving their fingers should not result in any significant uh, increase of pain. Although they may lose uh, pulse or sensory functions due if the humoral fracture is uh, interrupting those vessels and nerves. Again, if possible, correctly angulate it. So oftentimes their arm is going to be rotated out, bring it back in. Don't do that until you have some um, adequately provided pain management. And then when you do it, provide traction. Pull down on the elbow, pull away from their, uh, pull the two humeral shaft uh, portions away from each other before rotating it down. Um, and then provide that rigid splint. Uh, splint. Again, vacuum and air splints are honestly the best for this. There are versions of arm splints that you can, um, that have a rotation, you know, have an angle in them, a 90 degree angle, which can work like, um, like a foam arm splint. Another option is to take a SAM splint, wrap it with that 90 degree angle so it comes up high on the humerus, then wraps all the way down around their, um, elbow and arm but remember to, when splinting a humoral fracture you want to keep the arm bent same with with an elbow you don't want to splint the humoral fracture like this it's a much harder uh it's not very effective way to uh, splint that Cold packs can be very effective for the swelling uh just kind of monitor whether or not the swelling is a concern all right um again when you have elbow fractures, these are probably distal humerus or proximal radial ulnar fractures. It's very rare that the joint itself is fractured. If it's the joint itself that's involved, that is almost always a dislocation or a strain. Um, you're going to handle them very much the same way. Um, uh, the supination and pronation, when they do this, there's an increase of pain. So that's, you know, supination pronation right so um that would indicate that it's radial ulnar and not uh distal humeral so. very straightforward on the splinting there nothing really new when it comes to uh, a lot of these splints so i'm going to probably not going to talk a lot on the specifics um Direct blow, the nightstick fracture, they got struck with something hard right across their arm. Um, you know, apparently police brutality has been a thing for quite a while, right? And then uh, the coils fracture or the uh, silver, I call it dinner fork, silver fork, whatever, fracture um, where they fall in the outstretched hands. I brought that up earlier, skating, skateboarding, bike riding, um, ice skating, stuff like that. Um, 
When you secure these, this is where you're going to want to put a um, like a rolled up ace bandage inside their hand so that they're holding it and it puts their fingers into a neutral position. That way they're not extended, causing pain, or contracted, causing pain. So they have a very neutral position there. So scaphoid, this would be where it's not the radial ulnar. You're not going to have that extra joint look right here, but you're going to have very significant pain right in this area, maybe some swelling. Uh, inability to want to rotate their hand or then the boxers is where you get a fracture of one of the meta um carpals right here so carpals metacarpals phalanges so the boxers fractured they punched something you know so um if the patient's name is kyle if they like uh to wear um pit vipers or are big fans of monster energy drinks then you're probably going to watch out for their they're at increased risk of boxer fractures just just saying all right um here you're just gonna ice it mostly there's very little immobilization we're gonna do pre-hospital for these um all right i don't know why but i've seen this term right here the anatomic snuff box which in fact <laughs> is pointing to the uh a very poor example of it so what it's showing um, is it's in this picture your pay the hand is um, too far down or the thumb you know so we're trying to pull up and what you're looking for is this little indentation and if you bend the thumb it works better so you have these two tendons right here um, let's see I can, I don't, you know what, stand by. All right, so here we go, new camera view. All right, so what we're talking about here is up. All right, see more of the hand there. There we go. All right, so we can see the hand. We've got some focus going on here. What we're talking about is these two tendons right here, here and here. And see how that creates that little indentation? Oops, sorry. Right there. So we see that little indentation right I have so much error. There, that's better. That's a little better. All right, so this indentation, that's the anatomic snuff box. That's what it's talking about. So um, scaphoid fractures are going to have pain right there. That's what you're looking for. So scaphoid fractures would be that carpal um, that's right here in the wrist. So... Um, the thumb coming back down the joint of the thumb into that little spot right there so that's your anatomic snuff box. that's what it's talking about um, so you That camera. All right. So, so pain over the ulnar aspect of the hand, and that's on the side here, uh, is what the um, boxer fracture is talking about. All right. Um, So the mallet and finger, uh, signs of mallet finger where that you've hit it is that inability to extend your fingers out. Um, it's really not a big deal on these. Don't get over 
um, caught up on it. Pretty much any injuries to your hand, forearm, or anything like that, this is what your treatment is going to be. You place the ace bandage around into their hand so they're holding it tightly in kind of that kind of a scenario. And then, as you can see in the board, um, use some form of board splint, uh, vacuum splint, air splint, something like that to hold them. And like I was saying earlier when it showed the example with the long board splint on the leg, this is the ideal way to splint the arm using an ace or cling to wrap the entire um, arm and not just like prox two ends of it or something along those lines. So pelvic fractures are a big concern because uh, resulting in instability of that pelvis that can lead to a lot of blood loss. But one option or another concern is, especially if it's an anterior pelvic fracture, is a um, that bone fragments rupturing the bladder resulting in that peritonitis or um, infection within the pelvis of some sort. It's not peritonitis because it's not in the peritoneum or it, it's not in the peritoneal lining. So, um, but anyway, this could be associated with a difficulty voiding or a severe pain in their bladder or lack of urine um, loss or something, or you know, lack of urine production or perceived lack of urine production due to a lack of voiding. <laughs> If the patient has enough trauma to cause a pelvic fracture, you really need to suspect a greater, or you know, greater mm, increased likelihood of multi-system trauma. Another thing to remember is, especially in the younger population and healthy populations, a person has very strong bones, or not bones, muscles around their pelvis or lower abdomen and their legs. So a lot of your pelvic fractures are hard to identify initially because the muscles are holding the entire pelvis together and not allowing it to rock. And so you may not recognize the presence of the pelvic fracture until after the patient has uh, been sedated, paralyzed, or something along those lines uh, for a um, treatment reasons. So, um, yeah. Sorry. I think this should go without saying. It should be pretty straightforward. Um, here's a very common result of a lateral compressive fracture where the patient lands on that pelvis. You can see how in the image where the pelvis has been dislocated um, or displaced in an upward movement. Um, yeah. Not as much of a risk of hemorrhage is what it says on these. All right, so anterior pelvic fractures, this is where compression happens front anterior posterior so uh, weight on the front of the pelvis uh, compresses forward splitting the pelvic ring open so if you have your pelvis here this would be your pubic symphysis oops your... all right so here's your pelvis this is your pubic symphysis this is the sacral area back here and then that compression fracture will open it up that way that's what's going to create a lot more um, blood loss and this uh, fracture here, this open fracture where the pubic symphysis is um, lost, that is what will be uh, supported with pelvic binder. And we mentioned earlier, 3,000 milliliters of blood can be lost from a pelvic fracture. So inter massive internal bleeding, severe shock, um, could even show external bleeding as well from the urethra or the vagina or the anus. Your fluid loss, um, blood, blood loss, that is going to be your primary concern in these uh, pelvic fractures because you're really treating the shock more than the fracture. The use of the pelvic binder to um, slow the breathing, bleeding is very helpful. Just remember that the pelvic binder must be placed around the patient's hips at the um, greater trochanters of the fem femurs, not on the iliac crests, where, um, but down low 
right across the genitals, greater trochanters of the femurs. And that will not stop the bleeding. It will only slow the bleeding and uh, improve that blood loss. But your focus is needing to be IV fluid um, replacement and ABCs, rapid transport. So if you're using the SAM splint or SAM sling pelvic binder, these are a great tool. Um, where you're, um, it, once you, it clicks, it makes a very distinct clicking sound to know that you've applied the appropriate amount of pressure. So you'll just place it. You don't push on their um, pelvis. You don't try to squeeze their arm, pelvis together. You simply place the pelvic binder, pull the strap slowly and um, deliberately until you hear that click and then you engage the um, Velcro, you just, and that's all you have to do. All right, hip fractures. Do not put a pelvic binder on hip fractures. Remember, the pelvic binder is using the pressure, placing pressure on the hip to hold the pelvic girdle together. And you don't want to do that because um, if it's a hip fracture, if it's an isolated proximal femoral shaft or a uh, femoral head fracture, um, and you go and place the, on that inner trochanter there, the femoral neck, if you place pressure on that, you're going to compress that bone, you're gonna tear up vessels, you're gonna tear up nerves, you're only gonna make that injury worse. Oftentimes your hip fractures will have a shortening of the hip, but also an external rotate, or an, excuse me, an internal rotation. Hip fractures tend to rotate inwardly or medially. Um, My bad, I'm confusing it. I, I, it's contradicting me on the screen, and so use. So, all right, I was right the first time. They have an external rotation. They shorten the leg, pulls in, and then rotates out. With the dislocation, they actually have a lengthening and a rotation out. So, this is what you do for hips you uh, reduce movement of the leg. Here they're using the kind of anatomic splint, but instead of boards, they're using uh, heavy blankets folded up that will reduce the movement. Uh, you could secure the patient to the long board this way. Um, basically, you, you may put pillows up underneath their legs. This is where you're, um, you're trying to create the most amount of comfort and not really creating compression or traction. Yeah, high energy is like a younger person from like vehicle wreck hip fractures, then you're gonna longboard them. Talked a little bit about a um, femoral shaft fractures earlier. Uh, they should be easy to identify. Um, shock is a concern there and the treatment would be the um, hair traction splint that we discuss discussed function earlier knees um do not use the hair traction splint when the pain is near or the disformity is in the area of the knee um so what this is saying is if you're going to splint it, splint it the way it's found, you don't have to rotate it into position like we talked about with the uh, humerus. But um, if there is no pulse, you may need to adjust it. But again, you don't want to use a um, hair traction splint for a knee injury. Um, I think one of the easiest fractures to deal with is the distal tib fib fractures. While you could use a rigid splint of some sort, air splint, vacuum splint, anything along those lines, um, I think that one of the quickest and easiest ways to splint a tib fib is to wrap the extremity in a pillow, fold a pillow around the ankle, and then tape it up with two inch tape. Very quick and effective way to splint that tib fib. Um, so that's a very obvious tip fib there where they the splint has been placed above that. Maybe there's an additional tip fib. So um, there you can see the fibia there uh, fractured where the tibia is still in place, but the fibia is what's fractured. 
ice packs are great. Calcaneus, this is the lower part of the foot, basically the heel. Um, you're going to see this from a high impact vertical force onto the foot where they land on their foot and don't bend their knees. <coughs> Excuse me. Same thing. All right. Oh, I was going the wrong way. All right. So, all right. So now we're talking about uh, dislocation. So shoulder girdle. This would be a dislocation of the acromion chromium joint or the acromium clavicular joint. Uh, this is where the clavicle and the acromion process from the scapula join together right above the shoulder. And instead of the clavicle fracturing, you just separated those two uh, bones. They're a, typically considered a non-moving joint. Um, And uh, shoulder dislocation, generally the patient falls on the outstretched arm and it causes a dislocation, which is normally an anterior and rotational, or it pops out anteriorly. The uh, process for uh, reducing that re involves straightening the arm out, doing kind of a big rotation with it. There is a lot of vessels and nerves that run through the shoulder there. And if you pinch them during the reduction, it can cause pretty significant damage in the long run. So for that reason, we avoid reduction of shoulder dislocations in the field. Ankle dislocation uh, reductions, not that hard. You're just pulling traction, it pops back into place. But shoulder dislocations and hip dislocations have a lot greater risk of trauma. So we're gonna avoid doing those in the pre-hospital environment. Um, or maintain medication, uh, pain relief, uh, ice it, and take them to the hospital. Um, you would sling and swath a shoulder dislocation of any type exactly the same way that you would um, a scapular, uh, humoral head, or clavicular fracture. And pain medications. I don't think you should consider it. I think you should do it. All right, so dis, uh, dislocations of the elbow. They're a very unique dislocation here. As you can see, it tends to be a posterior, with causing a very large deformity of the elbow. Um, a little bit of traction right on that arm where you pull the lower portion of the arm, say right here, um, and pull it away put, or push it away. Um, from the humerus can be all that it takes to uh, reduce it. And once that's reduced, it's incredibly pain relieving for the patient. They're much more comfortable afterwards. There's a lot less of a concern. There is still concern of a um, pinching a vessel, of uh, causing nerve damage or something like that. So you want to be cautious with that. But it is still a... Um, great way to provide pain relief. I would avoid doing this without having uh, been demonstrated, um, having like an orthopedist or PA or somebody demonstrating how to do that to you. Um, I can probably, most of these injuries, like in your wrist and uh, fingers, if they get dislocated, they're going to reduce on their own. They very rarely will remain in the dislocated um, state. Um, patient starts to move a little bit and they pop back into place pretty quickly when we arrive uh, before we arrive on scene so it's pain ice and um yeah that's about it in fact most people reduce their own finger dislocations all you have to do is just pop it and there you go problem solved so yeah it says don't attempt to relocate it unless you know, approved, but like said, most of these reduce themselves and the patient will probably attempt to relocate it before you arrive. So, hip dislocations. So, as you can see, this is one form of hip dislocation where you would result in shortening. Other hip dislocations might recall, um, result in a lengthening. If it was an interior dislocation, this is going to be a posterior dislocation on this one. Um, 
but as you can see, m most of them are posterior. Uh, the pain, they may be more comfortable with that leg bent um, during transport instead of it being a straight leg. Um, now, knee dislocations, because of the nature of the knee joint, um, there, the hinge joint of the knee, there's very rarely is this going to be the joint between the femoral and the tibia. The femur and the tibia is, is almost always the patella. Um, if it is a actual dislocation of the joint, the, the femoral, the fem, femur and tibia, then you don't want to reduce that. There's a lot of nerves that run through there. But if it is a um, dislocation of the patella, that's a little different story. And we'll show you some stuff with that during the um, skills deck. Um, yeah, so ligament injuries are very common. Um, you know, MCL, ACLs, uh, these are very common injuries to the knee. Um, not really a, um, not a lot we can do. Now, if, uh, back to the knee dislocation, if it's the patellar dislocation, the best way to reduce it, the, what happens is the patella gets dislo displaced uh, laterally in some way sometimes it'll get rotated into a like a vertical position but generally it's it's just laterally dislocated off the anterior portion of the knee and then the knee the leg bends and that causes a greater tension causing the patella to get stuck in that position well all you have to do is straighten out the leg and then generally hyper or not hyper flick um you want to straighten the leg and then raise it up, causing as much relaxation on the quad and the calves as, and the um, shin muscles as you can. And then you'll just laterally replace the um, patella. So you takes you can do it with one person, but it's best to do it with two, whereas one person will take their, um, put one hand on the distal femur and another hand on the um, ankle, and then you push down on the distal femur, up on the ankle, straightening that leg, and then you will push forward, bending the hip, bringing the leg up to their head. So you're, you know, you've got your hand on their distal femur, and then you got your hand on their ankle like this, and you're pushing these two arms together that way, the rotation, and then bending their hip, pulling their um, ankle up behind, towards their head. While they're doing that, the other person, the other provider, would hold a hand above the knee and below the knee with both thumbs on the patella. And once the muscles have relaxed enough, they just pop the patella over. There generally isn't any nerves or vessels that run underneath the patella, so that can be a very easy um, joint to reduce, and it's very, uh, very pain relieving for them. It really helps a lot, um, far more effective than opiates. You can, on a smaller person who has uh, less developed muscles or something, you can reduce this on your own where you um, put the patient's injured leg ankle on your shoulder. You grab both hands on to their um, proximal, or excuse me, their distal femur just above the knee. And you're pulling that femur down towards you while you're leaning in with your shoulder. And so you're doing this pushing method pull down, lean forward, and start pushing their leg up towards their body. So in that, um, bending it that way, and then you can keep your thumb on the edge of the patella, and as it relaxes, pop the patella over with your thumb. That can be effective with a smaller person or underdeveloped or less developed leg muscles, but you get somebody bigger, somebody who's athletic, somebody who has good strong leg muscles, then you may need the two persons to work together on that. All right, uh, talked about that. Um, yeah, rotator cuff injuries. Again, we're going. There's not a lot we can do other than recognizing the potential for it, the the muscle weakness, loss of range of motion. Uh, generally, this is going to be like some form of pull or twisting injury, not so much a fall or direct blow. Um, 
cold packs and splint sling and swath whatever it happens to be achilles tendon ruptures are very obvious because the patient cannot point their toe anymore the pain will be in the lower port from their heel to their calf the lower portion of their leg posterior um, and their shin muscles will be contracting the um uh, We're contracting the foot, yeah, you know, the foot up and pulling, basically pulling their toes towards their shin. Um, you'll see this rupture like in soccer when they step down too quickly and hard on their uh, toes or something like that. Um, and uh, when they do this, they will not be able to, if you, you can get a lot of pain here, you'll feel the muscle cramped up underneath where the pay, uh, this provider's right hand is. Um, the muscle will draw up in there and then um, they won't be able to point their toes. Uh, so the Thompson's test is where you raise their foot up like this and then ask them to point their toe. They will not, the, the foot will continue to hang. So, um, all right, so this gets into musculoskeletal non-traumatic injuries. We don't spend as much time on this. Um, generally, this is going to be like your... Uh, degenerative bone disorders and things like that so, so osteomyelitis this is something that we um will well this excuse me i'm confusing with something else this is a, just a straight up infection of the bone though it can be possible after a uh, io insertion it's not very common we'll see this more commonly in a patient who has had an open fracture or something along those lines um so what are we doing? We're identifying its possi the possibility of these abnormalities and then um, advising or instructing the patient or providing the appropriate um, treatment options. So we may not give them the antibiotics and such they need, so we may have to transport them depending on their con the type of uh, bone or injury it is. We may be transporting them or advising them on the type of facility to go and get those antibiotics and treatment. If the patient's showing the systemic signs of like shock and things like that with sepsis, then we're probably going to need to transport them be um, because we'll need to do fluid resuscitation and such like that. All right, so tumors, bone tumors, tell you what, you can get some wild looking x-rays if you uh, research bone tumors um, and some really weird growths on the bones. But you'll see a deformity of the uh, bone where you'll have a mass growing along the side of it or something like that. So osteoarthritis, uh, we saw a picture of that earlier where the bone was, uh, where the joints were all um breaking down which means that when the muscles are pulling the joint isn't holding the bones in form anymore and so they change so your osteoarthrotic patient's hands will get kind of a look like this their fingers will curl under and instead of their wrist staying straight like this it will tend to flip i can't i physically cannot make my hand do it but instead of it turning at the wrist here their fingers will rotate here so that their wrist may be straight but their fingers have all rotated into this type of direction so their wrist here is in this form but then their fingers are turning very obviously in that form and curling under it's almost like their fingers point to the side so their wrist is this way and then their fingers are pointing off like that um, this is degenerative as a result of constant use and trauma to those generally rep uh, found with repetitive in, um, work uh, environments repetitive motion things like that rheumatoid arthritis is a autoimmune disorder this is where your T cells are destroying the cartilage and structures of the joints. And so this can happen in a much younger population, whereas osteoarthritis tends to be the elderly who have worked a career. The rheumatoid arthritis tends to be people who are still working age or even, you know, in their 20s and such um, because it's the um, autoimmune disorder. Gout is a buildup of uric acid in their joints, generally due to a metabolism issue, uh, maybe a sensitivity to foods, there, um, but a decreased function of kidneys, not being able, either excessive production or lack of um, 
Well, generally, it's an issue of, of excessive production. And um, there's a number of different medications that they could use in order to um, treat that, but they're really more of keeping it managed and not really providing true um, cure of it. All right, so um, septic arthritis, this is infectious. This is where we're talking about people with history of drug use, basically instead of getting HIV or hepatitis C or something like that from their sharing needles, they just created an infection in their joints because of that frequent um, intravenous drug use. So, um, yeah, treatments low impact therapy, pain control, joint injections. Um, there's lots of different treatments. We're not really gonna get into them because these are not acute conditions, um, not life-threatening. Rarely are we gonna be transporting these patients. It's just kind of more of a, this is what you, you need to know because you'll see it and be aware of it. Um, NSAIDs are great, but the problem with those are excessive use, chronic use of things like naproxen and ibuprofen and such can cause significant GI issues, whereas when a patient has long-term RA or even OA that they need treatment for, they'll probably be on Celebrex or something like that. These are a newer form of anti-inflammatory that does not have near the irritation issues on the um, GI tract. Okay, so myalgia, um, we've probably heard of fibromyalgia. This is a pain um, within the muscles, often associated with the nerves. It's not necessarily nerve pain like you would treat with uh, um, Neurontin. Um, oh, why am I blanking? I freaking know this medication. Probably sitting there saying it and thinking I'm an idiot. Um, um, Gabapentin, sorry, gabapentin, neurontin, it's the same drug, but um, which is often used to treat like diabetic nerve pain. This is not so much associated with the pain, um, with the nerves as it involves the pain, the muscle and the associated tissue. And so it seems very difficult to identify. Patients will have the pain come and go. Um, fibromyalgia, of course, is going to be the... Um, associated with the more fibrous tissues around the muscles and such like that. I think overuse syndrome, again, something that we might need to be familiar with because people call 911 for some crazy situations. Tendonitis, the tendon is inflamed. Why do we get it? Well, it's from excessive use of that, or repetitive use of that um, extremity. We see it a lot in fingers, like we call it carpal tunnel in fingers. Um, but it's a form of tendonitis where the tendons have been moving through their pathways so much that they've gotten inflamed and just uh, worn out. Um, pain medications like anti-inflammatories, rest ice and compression is very good for that. The bursitis is with the bursa where it's actually the joint tissue being worn out from the uh, excessive use. Uh, there you go. Carpal tunnel, cubital tunnel, um, the ulnar nerve at the um, uh, ulnar nerve is going to be here. This is where you'll have the cubital. Or you can't see down here in the wrist area, whereas carpal tunnel is going to be here. For advice only, this is more or less to explain to them. Yeah, you need to rest it. You got to put ice on it. You might need surgery to clean it up, um, but uh, physical therapy, maybe. But there's not much we're gonna do. And really, frankly, um, splinting it is only just to keep them from moving it further. It's very minor in its long term or overall effect. All right. Um, <clears throat> so this is where you have nerve damage. Uh, generally nerve damage to a nerve plexus, the large number of peripheral nerves running through a joint uh, or along a long bone or whatever that was fractured and now multiple nerve, uh, both uh, sensory or motor nerves are 
have lost function or have diminished function as a result of the trauma. This is one of the secondary traumas that we really want to avoid. This is why I don't recommend that you reduce a shoulder or a hip or in a lot of cases, in many cases, even your elbows, uh, dislocations and all that because you don't want to risk pinching those nerves and causing that problem. This is also another reason why if you have distal pulses and motor function, then there's really no reason to start moving that extremity around and manipulating it a lot because you could result in excess, um, increased risk of uh, trauma and things. All right, here's a, here are a couple other polyneuropathies. Guillain-Barre, this is an inflammatory condition, um, very similar to ALS, um, called Lou Gehrig's uh, Guillain-Barre. Um, we're going to talk more about that in our medical chapters, uh, neurologic uh, conditions in the medical chapters, but this is where you have a loss of function of the peripheral nerves. Uh, polio was viral. Um, result in a loss of nerve function as well, um, but not sense. This is a loss of nerve control, of, um, generally the lower extremities. So that wraps our chapter on musculoskeletal injuries. I hope it was helpful and that you were able to learn something from that. Again, a lot of these um, overuse issues and non-traumatic conditions, we will see them again in the medical uh, chapter or in uh, the um, patients with special challenges chapter. This will be the last chapter for our trauma section, getting ready for PHTLS. Um, so have a great weekend.